Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you here this, for this lecture this afternoon on behalf of Ambassador Ken Yalowitz, the director of the Diggy Center. Uh, Ken regrets that he can't be here th uh, this afternoon. Uh, he was called to uh, Washington to uh, give testimony uh, before Congress on Chernobyl, and, and as we speak, he's, uh, he's testifying. Uh, I'm Gene Garthwaite. I'm head of the uh, Middle East faculty working group on the Middle East in the Dickey Center. I'm also a historian. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Gary Sick to you. Uh, some of you heard Juan Cole when he spoke in February. Uh, and uh, immediately afterwards, things began to heat up and uh, with, uh, in terms of U.S.-Iran relations over, the, over this nuclear question. And uh, we agreed that uh, we should try to get Gary Sick to come to Dartmouth. And it turns out he's never been to Dartmouth before. And it turns out that he was free, uh, which is, is really quite surprising given, given his, uh, his schedule. Uh, those of you who know something about the Middle East know that uh, Sufis, Muslim mystics, are, uh, divide themselves into two categories, uh, those that are intoxicated and those that are sober. Uh, and, and the sober Sufis are grounded in reality. And of course, uh, Gary uh, uh, Sick is known uh, not only for the depth of his knowledge in the Middle East and for his judicious uh, analyses, um, but he, he grounds his ideas uh, and in, in reality. Uh, he has a very varied background. Uh, he uh, has served in the U.S. Navy. He's a retired uh, Navy captain. Uh, he served three administrations in the National Security Council, the Ford, uh, Carter, and Reagan administrations. Uh, and he was uh, President Carter's uh, chief uh, Iran aide uh, during the revolution and during the hostage crisis. Uh, he also has found time in his life to do a PhD in political science at Columbia. And uh, after his retirement from the Foreign Service, he's had a number of positions, one with the Ford Foundation, and then uh, more recently, he's had a number of appointments at Columbia. He's also uh, authored uh, 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 two books, probably the one that may be most familiar to you, is All Fall Down, America's Tragic Encounter with Iran. And uh, then he also did another book on the, um, uh, the hostage crisis called the October Surprise. Uh, then in addition to which, he has uh, co-edited uh, four other books and has a number of other, uh, other projects in the pipeline. There are few people better informed uh, on U.S. Oh, one, one other thing in terms of his introduction. A number of us are indebted to him for Gulf 2000, which is an ongoing uh, research project dealing with uh, the Persian Gulf area. Uh, and uh, he's, Gary's had all kinds of foundation support for this. It's extremely important for keeping us all abreast of what's happening uh, in the Middle East, on a, sometimes on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Uh, but it also, Gulf 2000 also gives us the opportunity to participate in ongoing discussions. And I was just joking with him that um, th there's a whole range of viewpoints that are expressed uh, on Gulf 2000, and, um, and some of them, the participants are not sober Sufis. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, he uh, joined me in welcoming Gary uh, this afternoon, who will uh, uh, talk to us about America, Iran, is conflict inevitable? Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Okay, I guess this is working. Good. Uh, thank you all very much for, for coming. It's a pleasure to, to see you all. If I were doing this at Columbia, the place would be empty. Uh, not necessarily because of me, I don't have that bad a reputation, but, the, uh, but because uh, unlike you, you're just coming up on your midterms, uh, we're on our finals and, and everybody is busily doing other things right now, so you can't get them to come out for anything. We, we turn off the speaker circuit about you know, the last 
three weeks of, of uh, the school year. Uh, it's a real pleasure for, for me to be here. Uh, actually, for anybody who works on the Middle East, and especially anybody who is interested in trying to promote a peaceful settlement between Iran and the United States, uh, it is truly a voice crying in the wilderness. And since <laughs> when, I, when I learned that that was the motto of this college, I, I felt immediately right at home. Uh, and then I discovered that the chairman of the board of trustees is Mr. Newcomb. And um, I figured, <laughs> how topical can you be? Uh, uh, and that's basically what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this, uh, this is my first trip uh, to, to Dartmouth. Uh, I don't know how I could have missed you all of these years. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here. And as I say, I immediately felt right at home. What I'm going to try to do is raise, um, to, to lay out a sort of schematic or framework to sort of look at the issue that we've got before us, the whole problem of uh, the relationship and the conflict of the, the, the tension between the United States and Iran. Uh, and I'd like to sort of lay that out very briefly, just with a, a series of points. I hope to make it as quick as possible. And uh, because I really want to open it up, I enjoy, I, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to say, and I don't really know what you want to say. And I would like very much to have a chance to get your questions. And I hope you'll be thinking about it, uh, because uh, you know, uh, really tough, complicated questions are the, the name of the game. And that's, as, uh, as Gene mentioned, that's sort of what I do all day, every day, uh, is field this sort of a relation, this sort of uh, uh, dialogue back and forth. And I'd like to do a lot of that here, if we can, if we have time for it today. So let me just start with uh, asking a, a a question of my own, and that is, you know, does Iran actually want a bomb? Um, there's no question that Iran wants nuclear technology. Uh, that uh, has been very clear for quite a long time. Uh, they have made it now a matter of national pride. And to some degree, that is getting in the way of everything else. Because having decided that they want nuclear technology, to Iran has an image of itself not incorrectly as a great power. They have a 2,500 year history, a very glorious history of empire, uh, and uh, basically being the world superpower at one time. And people in Iran have not forgotten that. They have a really magnificent culture of poetry and literature, uh, a truly unique culture of their own. And I must say that um, I. Um, with my many Iranian friends, I'm not aware of any other country in the world where people miss their homeland as much as Iranians do, that this is so much part of their makeup, their psychology, that being away from it is really painful. And uh, even people who are opposed to the regime, people who are very unhappy with what's going on there. And so they identify with the country in a very special way that isn't necessarily true for, for many other countries. That uh, actually then, but when you build that pride into a political issue, it makes it very difficult then to try to deal with it purely in a rational uh, way that is going to uh, parse itself out. Contrary to what you may have heard or believe, um, Iran actually is interested in nuclear energy uh, as a civilian nuclear program. <laughs> Uh, the question get asked, you know, why in the world does a country with all of those uh, oil and gas resources need nuclear? It's not just nuclear. They're experimenting with solar, and wind, and geothermal. Uh, they're the biggest hydroelectric uh, producers, uh, one of the biggest in the world. They build dams everywhere. And uh, the reason they do it is that their, especially oil uh, uh, resources, are finite and quite limited. They are. They are number the fourth largest producer currently, but they're declining. Uh, this is a, they were the very first country in the world to produce oil in commercial quantities. And a lot of their uh, fields are quite complex, and they're getting older. And uh, it's not going to last forever. Iran uh, is going to need, basically, with the price of oil around 75 bucks, uh, they want to sell their oil, not use it. Because when they use it at home, they subsidize it. Uh, 
Gas is really cheap in, in Iran, but that is basically a throwaway item, and it means that all the, the oil that they produce there is uh, oil that they could sell otherwise. So producing uh, energy in some other way is a very good thing from their point of view. And they're willing to pay a very high price to get there. Uh, there are differences of view inside Iran about what uh, should happen and whether a bomb should be built. There are, num there are some hardliners, not the dominant uh, people in the government, but there are hardliners who argue quite openly that there should be a bomb. Uh, regrettably, there are also um, people who are involved in the, so the strategy business, the, the think tank business, and, and <coughs> consider themselves sort of military strategists, and they listen to the Americans who say quite openly, well, if I were an Iranian, I'd build a bomb. There's no doubt that the Iranians want a bomb. But look at the neighborhood that they live in. Look at all the reasons that they would have for deterrence and all of this. And the Iranians scratch and say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so uh, I've been in meetings where that happened, actually, that the Iranians came in saying, you know, we're not interested in building a bomb. And by the time they went out, they thought, maybe we ought to rethink this, you know? Uh, so they, they actually listen to us sometimes, much to my regret. Um, but the official position of the government is that they do not want to build a bomb, that they only want a nuclear, they only want nuclear technology for its own sake, for all the, the good things that it can bring to them and that. And they've actually even turned it into a religious issue. There's a, a religious edict that has been issued saying that um, Iran uh, is not, that, that Islam does not permit Iran to build, store, or use nuclear devices, um, period. And for a, this is a clerical regime. I mean, that's, this, is, uh, this is serious stuff. And the edict was handed down by the, the supreme leader, the head of the, the government, and also, in effect, the head of the church. So you know, we tend to just ignore that, say, well, you can't believe that. I mean, who, who takes that seriously? But in their country, they do take it pretty seriously. So that's something, at least, to work with that I think a lot of people don't know about. The Iranians also note that uh, their record is not bad. Uh, in the Iran-Iraq War, which ran from 80 to 88, 1980 to 1988, um, the Iraqis used chemical weapons with our, uh, at least willingness, to, our acquiescence, if not our collaboration, uh, in really very massive quantities against the Iranians. And the Iranians did not retaliate in kind. They could have and they chose not to use those particular weapons of mass destruction against Iran, against Iraq, even though they were being attacked. So, and finally, I guess a point that we need to, to, to mention is that, that this, is a, this is being a very slow motion thing. The uh, Iran started like back in 1985 to try to develop nuclear technology and uh, has been at it now for a long time, that's uh, what, 21 years, They're, they have uh, been working at the thing, and they have just now enriched a minuscule amount of uranium. Uh, when you look at the overall record, that's not very exciting, actually, uh, compared to what Israel did or what South Africa did or what a number of other countries, India, Pakistan, all made progress much, much faster than that. So this is a, a big problem, and I agree that it is a big problem, and it's something that the world should be truly concerned about. But I would argue that it is not a crisis in the sense that it's an imminent problem that has to be dealt with this week, next week, or next month. This is something that Iran probably, if they decided right now to put aside all of the other things and say, we're going to go for a bomb flat out, it would at the very earliest, assuming that everything worked perfectly, and it never does, uh, it would be at least three years before they could get a bomb, and probably more like five to 10. So there's time to think about this and work on it. It is not something that uh, Iran is suddenly going to surprise us with a bomb tomorrow. Uh, all right, uh, that was the, I asked, you know, do they want a bomb? Uh, are they building a bomb? And how do we know? Uh, Iran has more inspectors uh, from the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, than any other country in the world. And they've had something like 70,000 man days of, of inspections over the last 10 years. 
Um, uh, so does that prove that they are not building a bomb? No, but it does, at least with all of those inspections, nobody has found any evidence that that is what they're doing, that they have a, a separate line that is, in fact, producing a bomb. So uh, I think all of us really need to beware what I call the sort of slam dunk syndrome, which we heard about in the Iraqi case, you know, that uh, when the president was being briefed on what Iraq had, and he said, is that all we've really got on the subject? And the director of central intelligence said, it's a slam dunk. You know, we know that they've got them. Well, he was wrong. And I'm very, very skeptical of people who make that same kind of slam dunk argument with regard to Iran, that regardless of what they say, no matter what they do, we know that they're really doing this and that they, they're really working on this. And uh, anybody who doesn't believe that, uh, anybody who doesn't realize that is really being taken for a ride. Just beware of that uh, judgment. But there's absolutely no question that Iran wants a full nuclear, nuclear fuel cycle, which includes enrichment, which is probably more than they really need. Part of the reason that they want it, as I say, first of all, is national pride. The second is that when Iran was attacked back in 1980 by the Iraqis, uh, and Iraq was quite prepared, Saddam Hussein was quite prepared to use chemical weapons, or what we would now call weapons of mass destruction, against Iran, and that was totally illegal in terms of international law, all of the international conventions that all of these countries had signed, including us, and including Iraq. Nobody said a word. Nobody raised a question. Nobody even suggested that Saddam should be punished. You couldn't even get it raised at the UN. They did some inspections, but you couldn't get the UN to even pass a resolution dealing with the issue. So Iran does have some reason to believe that other countries, when they say, oh, well, we'll provide you with nuclear fuel, um, Iran has reason to be skeptical that, in fact, when push comes to shove, if people are happen to be really mad at Iran, that they will, in fact, provide that nuclear fuel. So that's the argument, at least, that the Iranians make that they want it. Um, the reality is that there are something like 40 countries in the world that have a full nuclear fuel cycle. Countries which, if they wished, tomorrow could start building a bomb and probably within six months would have one. They don't, and we live with that. What really is going on is that Iran wants to join that club of 40, and the question is whether we can live with that. Ultimately, it really, as uh, Condoleezza Rice said the other day, it's all about trust, and whether we trust Iran, very few people trust Iran, with very good reason. Uh, their history is really bad. Uh, the, I mean, we have particularly the, the hostage crisis where they took uh, the American embassy, held our people for 444 days, and uh, that was something that I worked on for a long time and uh, remember quite vividly. But we had the Iran-Contra affair where, uh, you know, we tried to have, we, the U.S. government, tried to have an opening to Iran very badly, very badly managed uh, by any standards whatsoever. But... Uh, the Iranians then leaked the word about the thing and nearly brought down the Reagan administration. So you can argue that, in, in some respects, Iran has interfered in our politics to the extent of getting rid of one president, Jimmy Carter, and almost a second, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, toward the end of his, uh, the end of his term. Uh, we have reason to have questions about Iran and its behavior. And the current president of Iran, Mr. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, is making everything far worse. Uh, he has been an absolute disaster as far as Iran is concerned. And in turn, basically, when he arrived, Iran had a really um, well developed and quite sophisticated negotiating strategy, which they were pursuing with the rest of the world. And it may have been too tricky by half. Uh, it may have, in fact, been a cover for things that they really wanted to do. But it was very clever, and it was actually gaining strength. Uh, Ahmadinejad came along uh, and started making pronouncements on every subject under the sun, uh, 
shooting his mouth off left and right, and whatever support Iran had just plummeted. And people went back because they see Ahmadinejad as a throwback. Basically, Iran, you know, at the time of the revolution in 1978, 79, and 80, Iran was uh, actually promoting a revolutionary strategy. It was trying to overthrow governments. It was trying to export its revolution. A whole range of things were going on. Actually, that changed over time, and Iran actually got a lot more uh, willing to work with the international community and interested in, in developing a different kind of an image for itself. And it actually had made huge strides over the previous eight years. And Ahmadinejad came in, and within six months, had absolutely destroyed everything that had been done in the previous, actually, almost 16 years, uh, in which two different uh, presidential administrations in Iran had tried to change Iran's image. Uh, Ahmadinejad himself is a really interesting character. Uh, he, is, he comes out of a very conservative religious base. That is, that's the group that he speaks for. That's, those are the people who put him in office. He arrived in office with no background whatsoever in foreign policy. Uh, he's a fellow who believes in straight talk. You know, I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. Uh, no use for diplomatic niceties. If any of this sounds familiar to you. Um, uh, the, um, and he is a fundamentalist in the, sen in the truest sense of the word. A fundamentalist is somebody who wants to take things back to its roots, back to the origins, back to where these things originated. And that's what Ahmadinejad wants to do. He represents the war generation in Iran, the group that went off to fight against uh, Iraq. And that's where they, they learned their skills. That's where they grew up. That's what they know. That's, that's the politics that, that they experienced. That group has thus far been closed out of the really high-level politics. But they're just coming to age now where they are moving in. And curiously enough, although you think, or lots, lots of people believe that Ahmadinejad and, and his cohorts are really very close to all of the hardliners who made the revolution, that they're the ones who put the revolution together. In reality, this group feels that the old guard who made the revolution in many cases are the people who betrayed them because these are the people who didn't let them go ahead and win the war. It's very much like the Vietnam veterans uh, coming back, uh, many of whom said, you know, uh, you know, these people in Washington didn't have the will and to let us go ahead and, and finish the job. And if we had, we would have won this war. You can argue about whether that's true or not. And I think personally that the people in Tehran who made the decision to end the war were very wise. They ended it, uh, they should have ended it many years earlier, actually. But the, but the bottom line is that the people who were out on the front and the people who were fighting the war didn't necessarily share that view. And those are the people now who uh, the Ahmadinejad generation is coming in, wholesale firing these guys uh, of the old guard and replacing them with a whole new crowd. And we don't really know what they're going to do or, or what, their, what kind of position they're going to take. He also is a guy who thrives on conflict, that basically um, he, in the six months or so that he has been in office, and he's made these wild statements about Israel and other things, the international community has dumped on him, I think correctly, I mean, have pointed out you know, that this guy is, uh, is making statements that he shouldn't. Uh, and what has happened is that his base has coalesced around him, and he's far more popular now than he was before. So he's growing in strength, not losing. And so you have to sort of keep that in mind when you're thinking about which way you want to go uh, from here. There is, of course, a kind of rhetorical spiral that is currently at work, and you can't miss it. It's on the front pages of your newspapers every day. Uh, the Iranians make a statement of such and such a thing, and then Washington makes a statement, and Israel makes a statement, and you have this you know, spiraling up of the rhetoric, getting hotter and hotter and hotter as time goes on, uh, which is uh, in itself dangerous. 
um, because there always is a possibility that even if people are only doing it for show, and to a considerable degree, it's my own belief, that they are doing it primarily for show, that this is a negotiating tactic, that you, uh, when the U.S. puts pressure on Iran, it returns and puts pressure back and uh, says, you know, we don't care about that and, and uh, shows defiance and, and so forth, that this is very popular at home, and it also, they would argue, improves their negotiating uh, leverage, uh, that if they gave in, uh, then they would be seen as, as losing. And if they double the stakes, they're seen as being tough and resilient and that, in fact, they're, they're standing up for their rights. Uh, that is okay as far as it goes. But, you know, Iran's strategy to just strip away all the other things is really to create facts on the ground. They want to have a full nuclear fuel cycle, which includes at least some enrichment of uranium, and they are proceeding to do that. They're almost there. I mean, they've pretty well established that at this point. And I think there is no way that the world, the United States, is going to back them away from that. I mean, you're not going to be able to, to unteach them things that they've learned how to do. And the reality is they've arrived at a certain point. And then the question is, you know, where do we go from here? Well, before I look at possible ways out of this mess, uh, let me look at one of the things that is talked about a great deal these days, uh, and that is, uh, shouldn't the United States just, just go in and bomb these guys and be done with it? I mean, go and hit these nuclear sites and thereby resolve the problem once and for all and get it over with. We certainly have the capacity to go in and do a very significant uh, bombing capability. Well, first of all, uh, uh, let me say that I, I just like to just analyze what, that, what goes into that decision process because there are people thinking about that and I think it's worth thinking about what they need to think about. First of all, I personally, uh, again, do not believe that despite what you hear, that in fact Israel is likely to go it alone, that they're going to say, we're going to do this, you know, and, and uh, to heck with everybody else. Uh, Ahmadinejad and the Iranians are a threat to us, therefore we're going to go take care of it. There's no question that Israel has a certain capacity. They particularly have uh, submarines with, with cruise missiles, which could do a, a good bit of damage, uh, actually firing from the from the Persian Gulf, from the waters of the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. Uh, but that's very limited. I mean, you can do some damage, but that's not going to do the job. They have airplanes that can reach there just barely. And, uh, and unless they want to fly suicide missions, one-way missions, which I don't think is the way they're going to do it, uh, they need to both get there and get back. And that probably means refueling along the way. And then you have to think about how would, where would they go? How, how would they get there? Well, the bottom line is the way they would get there almost certainly is fly across Iraq. And it happens that's our airspace. So if they fly across Iraq and bomb Iran and return and do the, their air-to-air -air refueling over Iraqi airspace, we have to be part of that game. Uh, there's no way that they're going to do it without our knowing it. There's no way that they're going to be able to do it without advanced permission from us. And there's no way that they'll do it uh, knowing that in the end, we're going to get blamed for it, not them. More th I mean, we will get blamed for it even more than they will. So there's no way, I think, that they will act unilaterally uh, without a clear sign from the United States. And I think the strategists involved would agree that if you're going to, if you decide that you really must do this, then uh, letting Israel do it by itself doesn't make much sense, uh, that you might as well go all the way. And, and do it. So from my point of view, the whole idea that somehow Israel is going to take this on and do it is probably not true. There, there are secondary kinds of things that they could do, infiltrate guerrilla forces and things like that. But I think if you're talking about a major bombing effort, we all know what the U.S. situation is currently. We're distracted. Uh, we have, you know, we have uh, forces in Iraq. Uh, I don't know if all of you are aware of this. I looked it up the other day. Uh, you know, the 
everybody talks about the Marshall Plan in World War II that actually managed to get the European countries back on their feet again. The Marshall Plan cost $13 billion and lasted for four years. Uh, in today's dollars, that would be about $130 billion. We spend $10 billion a month in Iraq. We are spending a Marshall Plan's worth of expenditure every 13 months in Iraq. And uh, that's not counting the, the end costs of all of the people that are wounded in long-term care and all of this kind of thing, which actually some economists believe is, adds up the, the total bill, regardless of when we get out or how we get out or anything else, is probably going to add up to a trillion dollars uh, cost for the uh, Iraqi invasion. That's expensive by anybody's standards whatsoever. And then you have to think that Iran is, what, four times bigger in terms of population and geography than, um, than Iraq. It is a highly nationalistic nation. Uh, you're not going to have people, nobody is going to be throwing flowers at you, even at the beginning, uh, <coughs> and welcoming you coming in. And you really have to think about whether, you know, this is, so we have something, so whether we really have a, an option here that is something that we want to pursue. I mean, we're talking here um, just in terms of dollars. Uh, this is an expensive operation. There's no question that a, uh, a sudden uh, carpet bombing campaign, smart bombing campaign, could severely damage Iran's nuclear uh, facilities. Uh, there's just absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, and that's true, and it would certainly set them back a certain <coughs> period of time. But think of what the reaction would be. Uh, I think without question, you would rally the population around the hardest of the hardliners. They're the ones that are going to benefit from this. They're going to say, see, we told you so about these bad Americans and, and the way they operate and the only way we're going to defeat this. I remember vividly, because I was there at the time, um, after, the, uh, uh, the, after Saddam Hussein and, and the Iraqis uh, launched their invasion of Iran in 1980, um, the, uh, the Iraqis decided to do that because there had just been a revolution. The military was in chaos. The, the, the whole uh, economic situation in Iran was in chaos. And the, word, the, the belief was, and quite reasonably so, that a quick, sharp blow would just bring the whole thing come tumbling down, and that would be the end of the Iranian revolution. What happened? Everybody, including the people who didn't like what was going on with the revolution, all rallied around the, uh, the rulers, the, the clerical rulers, actually supported them. And I would argue, quite seriously, that Saddam's invasion actually saved the Iranian revolution, that it was in big trouble, and that this actually <coughs> made it easier for them. Um, and if that is the kind of reaction that you get in a, in a case when they were in real chaos, what are you going to get with a much better organized regime that has much more resources at its command than they had at that time? Uh, I think it's also clear that uh, Iran would throw out all of those inspectors who are the ones that are telling us what's going on there and keeping track of what's happening. And we know what happened in, in Iraq. We, we didn't worry about the inspectors getting thrown out because we were sure they weren't looking in the right place and they didn't know what was going on. Later it turned out they knew a lot about what was going on and they turned out to be right. And we turned out to be wrong with our intelligence. Uh, I hate to see us replay that and go through it again with the inspectors being thrown out and all of our monitoring capability gone. And the other thing that I think is quite clear, Iran would, retire, would leave the non-proliferation treaty uh, for what that's worth, but it is worth something actually. And I think they would clearly decide that religion or no religion, we're going to go underground, and now we have to get a bomb. There's no question that we've got to do that. And we've got to use all of our resources to get it just as fast as we can. So the results that you get with the bombing are precisely the opposite of what you would like to see. And you're, then you're going to guarantee that Iran coheres, that there's no difference of opinion inside Iran, that the hardline leadership takes over and dominates things, 
and that they, at that point, say, we must have a bomb for self-defense. And that's not, I think, the outcome that we really would like to get. There's another side of this that I hesitate to mention, actually. But there are about a million Iranians living in this country, Iranian Americans, who are patriotic Americans who love this country and who have devoted themselves to it, in many cases have, have been really important in building American businesses and infrastructure. And these are smart, capable, talented people. And I wonder what would happen to those people if we suddenly went in and bombed their homeland. Uh, I, I know we would turn a lot of Iranians in Iran against us. What would happen to all of those people who are here and that are our neighbors? I don't like the thought. And uh, I, you know, I, don't, I don't even like to talk about it, frankly. But I think it is something that we never talk about that, in fact, is worth thinking about in terms of the kinds of costs that are associated with this kind of, of confrontation and something that I would prefer not to, to think about, frankly. But ultimately, if Iran did all of those things that I just described, there really is only one way that you can go in and stop that. Let's say that they're deep underground now and they're going for a bomb as fast and as hard as they can. You no longer know where they are. You no longer know what they're doing. You no longer have inspectors on the ground. And you can only see so much from the air. And I think at that point, there's only one possible way to deal with the problem, and that is boots on the ground. You've got to have people go in and physically look and attack and, and try to take out these facilities. Um, and I think we all know what that means. Uh, we're talking here a much larger country, uh, and we've learned some lessons about doing it fast and easy in small numbers. We're talking about a lot, of, a lot of troops, a lot of troops, which we don't have presently. And frankly, if you carry the whole logic of the thing through, you're talking about a draft. And you think you've got political problems now? Try that for size. Uh, the colleges here, I assume Dartmouth is like Columbia and a lot, most of the other schools that I go to, that uh, the students are busy with their classes and they've got other things to think about. And they're not, they're not out in the streets marching for the most part. But try putting in a draft and see what happens. And suddenly, you're going to have a repeat of the 60s. And think about that, too. So every way, every way I look at it, it doesn't look good to me. You know, I don't see anything. So OK, so what is to be done? Do we just throw up our hands and say, oh, no, well, we, nothing we can do about this. So uh, let's just uh, forget about it and let nature take its course. We have had a policy toward this particular issue of changing the goalposts uh, periodically. Uh, when we first started worrying about Iran having a nuclear, cap uh, nuclear program, especially in the 90s, uh, we, uh, we took the position, the US government took the position, and they we're talking about at least four different administrations now, all sizes, shapes, and descriptions. The US government took the position that Iran should have no access to nuclear technology at all. In other words, nuclear physics is out. And, and I always thought, you know, here's a country of you know, now going on 70 million people with a lot of money, uh, a glorious tradition. Are they going to just remain dumb forever? That's not a realistic prospect. And sure enough, it wasn't. They went ahead. And then when that, of course, didn't work and Iran began to develop uh, nuclear capability, we said, OK, but no nuclear power plants. No civilian nuclear power plants because who knows, they might be misused and they could also act as a cover for people to learn how to do things that we don't want them to do. And we did a lot to try to prevent that from happening. And Iran finally went to the Russians and the Russians sold them a nuclear power plant, which is now being built taking forever for it to happen, but you know, they, they're having nuclear, they're going to have a nuclear power plant probably by the end of this year, a functioning one. And when we saw that happen, we said, well, OK, nuclear power plants are OK because they're really civilian and, and, and we can live with that, but no enrichment. 
Now they've got enrichment. Minuscule, probably just a quarter of a gram or something like that is all they've produced thus far, which is no threat to anybody except that it shows that they can do it. And they have crossed that line. So where do we draw the line? What, what should be our objective? What do we really want? Well, to me, I, I must say, I, I've thought that this was pretty clear for a long time. So maybe I'm, you know, uh, maybe I don't really understand the problem. But to me, what we wanted was an Iran that doesn't have a weapon. We want an Iran that doesn't have a nuclear weapon. Now, if you're willing then to make it worth their while to stop short of that, you have to think about what are you prepared to put on the table and what are you prepared to let them put on the table. And to me, the nature of the bargain that can be done, and it's, I, as I say, I, I've been believing this for years and years and years, is that at least Iran was going to have a token amount of enrichment, just to show that they knew how to do it and demonstrate that they had that capability so that nobody could take it away from them. But then once they had it, you could, I think, make cut a deal in which they have a very limited amount. The size that they've got now is really minuscule and not much of a threat. And you surround that with monitoring and inspections on a very, very significant basis so that you're aware of what they're doing and how they're doing it and keeping an eye on everything, inspectors all over the place. And that does two things for you. One, it means that if Iran changes its mind and decides that it's going to go for a bomb, you have advance warning, as much advance warning as possible. And by keeping it small, you've extended the time that it would take them to actually go from that decision to the point where they actually build a bomb. Now, that's not perfect. I mean, if I had my druthers, I'd rather have Iran's, have the Iranians to be completely stupid also I mean, and not have any access to nuclear technology and so forth. But that's not in the cards. It's not realistic and it's not going to happen. The interesting thing to me is that last year, the Iranians offered that to us. That was the deal that they put on the table with the Europeans. And we all just rejected it out of hand as being completely unacceptable because it involved enrichment. And, the, and so letting Iran have even a little enrichment meant that they knew how to do it and that then that would speed them up if and when they, they chose to go on. It's a particular way of looking at the situation that I think is really, I think it, has, I think it hasn't worked. And, and I think it's not going to work. And the problem is I'm really worried now that I think we had a real opportunity, not only just last year, but in the years before, to work out an arrangement with Iran in which they would have seen that as a really good outcome. That would have been really attractive. And it's something that we could have bargained with. Every time we've moved the goalposts, though, it doesn't look so good to them anymore. I mean, they've already done it. So what's to bargain about? And I. That, I think we've come to that point. And what I don't know is now whether the, whether the offer that they put on the table and we rejected a year ago is going to be something that we can go back to now and convince them that they ought to do it. Uh, technically, it's still on the table. There's another aspect that I think really is important to talk about and to mention in terms of a strategy. And that is whether what you're really aiming at here is not the nuclear weapon, but the regime and the regime change. That basically, you start with the assumption that we can't trust these guys at all. Therefore, nothing is going to be resolved. We can't have any confidence in them until we get rid of the whole bunch. And so what that, the message that that sends, and this is, by the way, the negotiating strategy that we used with Saddam, where we said, you know, you should change your behavior on this, you should do away with this, you should accept this, you should do that. But even if you do that, we're going to overthrow you anyway. That really was our position, that we would not accept anything short of regime change. That's not a good bargaining position. Uh, you know, governments that realize that you're going to overthrow them anyway don't have a great incentive to negotiate with you over what the terms are going to be of, of that settlement. And so I, I just put that out. The, the problem is right now, um, I think there has to be regime change in Iran, but I think it does have to come from within Iran, 
not from outside. I don't think we can go in and impose uh, a new government on Iran. And if we try, it'll, it'll be a worse government than if we didn't try at all. There are things that we can do. And I think we've realized at long last that, that this is something we should be paying attention to. But I worry very much because what we're doing now is we've passed a $85 million appropriation to try to promote democratic change inside Iran. And what's that, what that has done is make it absolutely impossible for any of the civil society groups in Iran to operate because they're all seen now as spies or traitors uh, and pursuing the United States. We could have done it for free years ago, and we refused to do it because of the sanctions that we have on Iran. We wouldn't let, we wouldn't let non-governmental organizations go in and do the work. Now we're trying to buy it belatedly, and I think we've just messed it up really, really badly and, and made it look worse than it would have otherwise. Um, the, the big danger that I see uh, right now is that as we go into this rhetorical spiral and things get hotter and hotter and hotter, it's going to, at some point, there's a danger that it's more than just talk, that if everybody is painting themselves into a corner, throwing threats at each other, saying what we can accept and what we absolutely cannot accept, there's always the chance that your bluff will be called, that you will have to, in fact, stand on that position that you've taken. And what I worry about right now is that there's a real chance of, say, an accident. You have an unexplained explosion at an American embassy someplace, or you have some kind of problem in, in southern Iraq, and and the suspicion is that Iran was involved in that. You have a clash along the river in, where Iran and Iraq come together up there. You have something with the Kurds going on back and forth. A thousand different things that could happen where you have this really trigger-happy you know, trigger situation in which everybody is right on a hair trigger waiting for something to happen. Then something happens, and before you find out whether it was real or not, you feel you've got to react. You've got to do something. You've got to show that we're not going to accept this. And you could end up with a, an accidental uh, escalation that I think could really be very, very serious. Uh, after all, that is sort of the way that the um, First World War got started. That, that not, most people really didn't want that war to happen, but they felt constrained because they had made <coughs> statements, they had made commitments, and so forth. And one thing led to another, and we ended up with a brutal and devastating war. I think there's only one way out of all of this, and it's a very simple way out, but one that we have rejected. Every US administration, from Jimmy Carter to the present, has rejected, and that is to actually talk to them. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty dramatic, um, but you know, we talk to we talked to the Russians during the Cold War when there actually were missiles sitting and poised to, to fire at each other. We talked to the Russians during the middle, middle of the, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, which was the closest we ever came to destroying the world. We talked to the Chinese. Uh, we have talked to, we were talking to the North Korean regime, which is almost certifiably insane. <laughs> and we, we went through a war with Vietnam. 50,000 Americans were killed. We now have diplomatic relations with Vietnam, and people are going over there for vacations and doing business uh, in the country. Iran, we, we cannot talk to them at all. We've had no significant contact with them, with the exception of the aberration of Iran-Contra and a few other small cases uh, in that whole 27 years. And I think. We're going to have to find a way. And it, this is not just us. The Iranians are very reluctant to get involved in talking as well. So it's not a simple thing. It's not just saying, OK, let's talk. Uh, but I think we're at the point where we're going to have to find a way to do that. And we're going to have to talk because we have problems, not <coughs> letting the problems keep us from talking. So having covered all of that, uh, I hope a few of you have had some questions come up in your own mind. Uh, and I would be delighted to, to respond to them. Um, I'm going to intervene very, very briefly. 
Uh, Gary will field his own questions. Uh, there's only one ground rule, and that questions will come first from the students. And then uh, when they've been exhausted, then we'll throw it open and hit the floor. But, but go ahead. You ask them to stand so we can see. Yeah. All right, would you, uh, students, stand and speak clearly? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Are the, uh, Thank you. Are all of the students exhausted? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Successes in other places. Uh, we have background in this. Uh, Any hopes that that could uh, work out? Well, there is actually a, a a deep desire in Iran for regime change. Uh, we had eight years of Mr. Khatami, the president, who was pushing the idea of reform. Unfortunately, not pushing it effectively and not pushing it successfully, but because he represented serious reform of the present situation, of the present government, he won a 70% mandate two times in a row, despite the fact that he, especially the second time, was not showing much chance of, not showing much success for what he wanted to do. So the desire is there in, inside Iran. The question is, you know, I look at these people who run the government there. These are the people who ran a revolution. And they overthrew the Shah. They have a pretty good idea how that's done. And so they look around and watch for any alternative leadership emerging any place who might actually speak for, the, for an alternative form of government, speak for major reforms or changes in the government. And as soon as anybody appears, they, they're on them. They're, they, they either they put them in jail, they intimidate them, they harass them. They make their lives difficult. Often, they end up um, uh, taking a year off because it gets too hot in Iran. And so they leave the country and, and go off. They all seem to come to Harvard. I don't know why this is. Uh, <laughs> but Harvard has this sort of rotating Iranian presence uh, that uh, is going through. Um, but in the end, by the time they go back home, uh, they're usually quiet. And I've seen this happen now with now, three, four different people who had the potential to become real leaders of, an op of a serious opposition, and they haven't been able to carry it through. There's another problem, and that is political organization. Uh, it's not a strong suit for Iranians. Uh, uh, they're not the only people in the world that aren't good at political organization, but it really is sort of counter to their political culture, this, this idea of getting out and knocking on doors and, and putting coalitions together and building mass organizations. They did it during the revolution of basically mobilizing people to come out in the streets and demonstrate. But to, to do it in the sense of building a political organization that will actually work to change things in a sort of steady, regular way, they've never come up with that. I think, I, I'm, I think I'm safe to say in their entire history they have not come up with something like that. So, that is also a problem. That's something that, that Mr. Khatami had as a possibility and never really pursued. And I think that was one of the things that, that was really too bad. I, I personally believe that, that there is going to be real change in Iran and democratization. Uh, I can't tell you when. And I can't tell you exactly who's going to be doing it. But I do think that the will is there. The Iranians have had major efforts in the past to try to change their political system with some success. They installed a constitution a, a century ago when nobody else was thinking in those terms. Um, they, and they held on to it, even though it didn't turn out to be very effective. In the 1953 period, they nationalized the oil industry and followed Mr. Mossadegh. Uh, US and British intelligence got rid of him and put the Shah back on the throne. And in 1978 and 79, they had a genuine popular revolution. That's a record of sort of fighting for political rights that all, I don't think any country in the Middle East has, and very few countries in the world do. It suggests that there is a demand for that um, in the Iranian body politic. But how that will show up and when, I can't really predict. But it uh, thus far has been quite elusive. Yes, sir. 
Could you talk a little bit about the power relationship among the senior leaders among the Supreme Leader and the President? <coughs> Uh, yeah, it's uh, to talk a little bit about the relationship between the senior leadership in, in Iran. Uh, well, Iran is unusual in, in many ways, but one of, the, one of the things that makes it quite unusual, especially for a Middle Eastern country, is that although it's quite authoritarian and repressive, it also has multiple power centers that compete with each other uh, very actively. And those change over time, and they shift and move. Uh, I think when Mr. Ahmadinejad was, was elected, it was a surprise. He didn't, nobody knew he was going to win that election until a few weeks before the election took place. But at the end, all the hardliners uh, from the supreme leader on down threw their support behind him, thinking that he was the best of the lot that they were going to get out of this election. And he did win. Uh, and I think most people then assumed, OK, he won, so he's really in their pocket. I would argue that it just hasn't worked that way at all, that he hasn't been in anybody's pocket uh, since he was elected. He's very much speaking his own mind, doing his own thing. And he is he's a, a Chavez-type character, a, uh, a populist, rabble-rousing leader who really addresses himself directly to the mob, directly to the, the, the people, and stirs them up. And the people on top who have a pretty sweet deal. I mean, they've used the revolution to line their own pockets. They've, they've got all of these things where their families are nicely occupied and, and getting fat incomes from uh, working with different foundations and this sort of thing. Um, and they watch this guy come in and start just breaking crockery left and right. And it's not a very happy situation from their point of view. A lot of people. Um, you know, are thinking about how do you get rid of this guy? You know, uh, and he's only been there six months. You know, and they're they're thinking, you know, my God, what did we what did we get ourselves into with this? So that's two power centers. They don't say that, of course. I mean, this they, they all say, oh, we all are united in our interests of you know supporting Iran and so. But the, it's not too hard to read those tea leaves behind. Another uh, power center clearly is Mr. Rafsanjani, who has been president in the past and was one of the original people who put the revolution together and who ran against Ahmadinejad in this last election, he still has a power structure in, in existence in Iran that is significant, but it's dwindling. Uh, it's, it's being destroyed as we speak by Ahmadinejad. But it is an important power center, and it's separate from the supreme leader. They're not the same. So, Because actually, in this case, Khamenei, the supreme leader, actually conspired to make sure Rafsanjani didn't get elected. So you know, there's no love lost there in some ways, although they have been colleagues from the early days of the revolution. There are other power centers in Gom in the, in the uh, high level uh, clergy who in many cases are really very, very conservative and others who actually are quite liberal. And there's then the remains of the reformists who they're in pretty tattered shape right now. They, they, they lost uh, badly this last round but they still have a lot of popular support uh, if they could mobilize it somehow. And all of these are constantly shifting around, making coalitions, supporting each other, and then moving off, and they change according to the issue. And if nothing else, I mean, it may be bewildering, but it also makes it quite interesting to study Iranian politics because there's always something going on. Uh, but I, uh, I don't know that anybody could, in fact, draw a chart and tell you exactly where everybody is at, at any given moment. Yes. Why, unlike as you mentioned, the Soviet Union and China during the Cold War, have we had such limited contact with Iran? Well, I think our limited contact with Iran is not just. Um, am I doing that? I wonder. Um, the. Um, You're too close to the other mic. Well, I, he said he turned those off. Um, anyway, um, the um, to me. The, the number one reason why uh, we haven't been able to reestablish relations with Iran is uh, the hostage crisis. That basically uh, Iran took 50 of our people, more or less 52, uh, started out with 60 or more, uh, and, and deliberately held them 
for 444 days really humiliated a superpower. And ultimately, really, uh, the combination of all of those factors ended up in Jimmy Carter losing his job. There were other reasons why he lost his job, but that was very, very important in that, in that election. Uh, I, and there were and are people in the US government who will never forgive Iran for that um, and all of the things that, that went along later. By the time we got to 1985, Ronald Reagan decided to actually try an opening to Iran. Unfortunately, I mean, he turned it over to Ollie North and company and decide, rather than run it in any kind of a sensible way. And, uh, you know, I mean, Ollie was a hard working guy and very, very smart guy, actually, but actually held the position that I had had at the National Security Council before. I didn't do any of that. I, I couldn't have figured out how to do it. I mean, it was, I was, when I went back and looked at his notebooks and things, I couldn't believe all the things that he was doing all at the same time. But, but there were limits to what he could put together. And they were relying on a couple of really sh shoddy uh, contacts, uh, people that had been picked up. And it was a, this whole thing was just cobbled together. And they flew off to Iran uh, with uh, basically a hope that they would actually meet with somebody when they got there. And they were told that they would, but it, nothing had been really prepared. And then the Iranians met them, and it was this sort of you know, catch-20. It, it was really a crazy operation. And then it all broke apart, fell apart, and, and, and uh, they left, came back. And then the thing broke in the papers and practically brought down the whole administration. Uh, our experience with Iran has been really bad. You know, and also in this country, there is, if you look at it in terms of domestic politics, and I think you have to look at it in terms of domestic <coughs> politics, over the years, because of this, Iranians have acquired a certain image. The Iranian government has acquired a certain image in this country. And it is, in some sense, there is there's no politician is going to gain a vote by saying anything nice or doing anything nice to or about Iran. It just isn't there. On the other hand, if you curse Iran and look tough, people may like it and think that you're really being, you're, you're doing it right. And that goes right straight up through to the president and everybody else. So you have a, you know, a, a sort of built-in system. And I must say that the same thing is true on the Iranian side, that basically one of the last things that remains of the revolution, I mean, the, all that fervor and all is mostly gone. But the one thing that remains is that on Friday prayer services, everybody can stand up and say, death to America, you know, and wave their fist. Uh, they, it's a routine. It's something that you go through. But, you know, it's one of the last routines they've got left. And, uh, and if people have been saying that for 27 years, it is a little hard to suddenly say, well, let's, you know, get along with these people instead. There are people who have tried, but it hasn't really worked so far. So I, I really look at U.S.-Iran relations as a kind of seesaw, you know, where you have one side up and the other side down. And that's usually the problem. One side feels it doesn't need to talk. The other side feels that it would be subordinate if it tried to talk. And then it, the, the positions reverse, as they often do. And then, and then but still people don't. Finding a point of equilibrium is really difficult. I would argue that maybe we're fairly close to that right now because the United States is hurting uh, in Iraq and elsewhere. We have things that we can gain uh, by working with the Iranians. And the Iranians have things that they can gain working with us. We're a neighbor of theirs now. So you know, I think there are the possibility. Plus, we sort of, you know, as it gets closer and closer to some kind of a really desperate confrontation, it actually uh, makes it worth everybody's time to stop and take a deep breath and say, do we have to keep doing it this way? So I'm perpetually hopeful, but I've been disappointed over and over again, and I'm not, I won't be surprised if I'm disappointed again. Yes? Um, yes, I did. You spoke about a uh, spiraling up of rhetoric, the yeah. danger that at some point, you know, more than this rhetoric. Yeah. I'd like to read a, a couple of Ahmadine quotes, if I could. Um, he said, 
Like it or not, the Zionist regime is headed towards annihilation. The Zionist regime is a rotten, dried tree that will be eliminated by one storm. The Ahmad said, Israel must be wiped off the map. You could go on all day with these things. I was wondering, is there anything this guy can say that you <laughs> take him seriously? I mean, do you really think that they're not trying to get a bomb to use against Israel? Yeah. Well, that's, the, you know, that's precisely the argument that is used by everybody who says, you know, uh, don't even bother thinking about it or negotiating. They're going for a bomb, and that's the end of it. There are two points that I would make. First of all, those, um, if you actually read the context in which those were made, and I invite the full text of, of Mahdi Dijad's latest press conference, which got widespread quotation by one or two sentences, uh, is available. And I think if you read it through, it says, for instance, that anti-Semitism should be ended, that uh, that there's that that you know that the the real problem there is that the Palestinians, not us, the Palestinians, are paying the price for what happened in World War II and the persecution of the Jews, and why should we have to pay for that? Why should the why should the Middle East have to pay for that rather than the people who did it? the Germans and the French and, and all of those other people. I think you would find that there's a little more context to what he said than the particular. But those phrases are quoted very widely and with exactly the import that you, that you suggest. And that is, anybody who could make those statements is completely untrustworthy. The second point is that he's not in control. At this stage, he really has very little control over, over foreign policy in general and certainly over nuclear policy in particular. And so to me, what you would like to do is get the system out of his hands if you can. That may be a hard thing to do. But when you've got a system like Iran in which there are multiple power centers, you have something to work with along that line. And I would like to see us try. You know, I can't guarantee you that it will work perfectly. but. Uh, also, if you are suggesting that because of those statements, we should expect that, say, Iran one of these days is just out of the blue going to launch a, a missile at Israel, and that that's, that's that. If you read what he said, it was actually the Palestinians who were going to be that storm that blew them away, not, not the Iranians. And, and both he and, and Khamenei in the last two days have said you know, that we have no intention of attacking anybody. But, you know, uh, you don't have to believe that. Uh, but you know, the, the reality is that I, I see no chance whatsoever of a sort of sudden major attack by Iran, not because they might not feel that way on certain days and certain times and certain <laughs> leaders, but because they know that Iran would become a sort of glowing parking lot shortly thereafter. And, and you know, they are not suicidal regardless of what anybody may think. So how do we get from here to something that's more sensible? And I think that's the real issue. You can't change him, and I think the Iranians are unhappy with him and would like to change him. But you know, for the moment, we've got to live with this guy. But does that mean that we then sort of systematically go about making our situation worse? You know, I, I have a hard time buying that. Yeah. Um, in the event of Iranian proliferation, um, what are the potential effects on the regional politics, especially considering that Iran is achieved? What are the uh, effects of if Iran should get a bomb, it proliferates? Um, what happens to the rest of the, the region? Uh, I think it's generally bad. Um, I, uh, I really do think that, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia has made some, some stabs in that direction in the past. Uh, most people don't know it, but Saudi Arabia has the longest range missiles in the Middle East, actually, uh, sitting out in the desert that they bought from the Chinese uh, quite a few years ago. And as far as I know, they're still operational. And they actually would carry a nuclear weapon, though I don't think the Saudis presently have one. But if they felt the need, I expect they could buy one someplace. And uh, so they have the capacity of, of becoming going nuclear. Egypt had a nuclear program uh, years ago and gave it up. And you know, they might see that, that this would be something. The Iraqi government, when it gets its act together, if it does, is not necessarily going to, I mean, I think we've seen there's a certain chance of actual independence there. 
And if that happens, they might decide not for the same reasons that Saddam had, but that they live in a dangerous neighborhood and they're closer to Israel than, than the Iranians are. And so they need that as a, as a defensive mechanism. So they might go back, despite all of our efforts, and go for a, a nuclear weapon. Uh, there are plenty of cases around. And of course, Pakistan already has one, and India, uh, and to the north, uh, the Soviet Union, or the Russians do, and uh, some of the other uh, Central Asian states had nuclear uh, weapons in the past, but they're supposed to be gone now. And of course, the United States is there. It's the biggest power in the Middle East, and we have nuclear weapons. So uh, it, I, I think the chances of, of major proliferation are serious, and I, I hope we don't have to cross. That's why I say let's keep our eye on the ball, because I think if, if we can stop Iran from actually going to a weapon, we actually will have solved that problem, because other countries then will not be tempted to do it. If they cross that line, then I think we've got a real problem on our hands. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we're Oh, you got it. Uh, I'm interested in uh, his choice to deny the Holocaust. Uh, is that a choice that he made specifically because he's mouthing off and that's what he believes? Or is it a choice he made because it's one that's popular for him in the country? In which case, if that's the case, is it the case that, is it, is it, is, is it because that the Iranian people believe that the Holocaust is a uh, The Iran has been really angry with Israel from the very beginning. I mean, that was part of what the, the revolution was about. Uh, that when, when, when Ahmadinejad says that he's quoting Khomeini and all of these things, he is. I mean, those things are not being said for the first time by Ahmadinejad. They were said by Khomeini 27 years ago and have been said routinely over the years. There is actually not just in Iran, but in the Middle East generally, a, a sense of victimization. And there's the sense that we're paying for the sins of Europe in World War II, and that we're the ones that are being punished because of this. And I can tell you that when people find themselves in that position, they look for all kinds of excuses and, and ways out. And one of the things is to say, oh, the Holocaust was really a fraud. It wasn't real. And that is just a, a, a myth that is being foisted on us to punish us as, uh, as Arabs and as Palestinians and so forth. Um, anybody who has spent a lot of time in the Middle East over the years will have heard these stories and will have heard people say these things. Um, so it's not something that he is inventing. It's not something that he, it's ugly, it's stupid, it's false. He is now backing away from some of his statements. And you know, he's now saying, well, if the Holocaust is real, then. I mean, that's what his latest speeches all say. And I think it's because he's learned that, you know, that this is not playing very well. But in terms of playing to his audience, I think it does. Uh, actually, anti-Israeli feeling in Iran, uh, I, I don't know that I can address this really directly, but is, um, is about the same as I would say it, as it is in Saudi Arabia or in Jordan or in Syria or even in Iraq, that it's not that different. Uh, it's because of the policies over the years and this whole sense of victimization and so forth. And so there, these views, these kinds of views, which are shocking to Europeans and, and Americans, are things that mostly don't get said publicly in the Middle East, but which are actually believed and circulate widely on a popular basis. So in that sense, I think initially, probably Ahmadi Najad was just sort of talking off the cuff and saying things that, that he believed. Nobody ever told him otherwise. And, and has learned since that that has consequences, a lot of consequences. Um, but as time goes on, I think it also, he, there is a certain appeal that he's appealing to his own base, if you like, and that they, they're, they're happy with this kind of really tough talk regarding Israel. So it doesn't really hurt him domestically, but it hurts Iran you know, uh, throughout the rest of the world. But if you look carefully, you'll find the same kinds of statements, at least privately, not only with Iranian politicians, but with a lot of people 
in the Middle East who really are you know, permanently angry at Israel uh, and the United States. And this is, this is how it comes out. And it's ugly, and, but it's, a, it's simply a fact of life in the Middle East, and it's not going to change until there's some sort of resolution of the Arab-Israel uh, situation. I, there's, no, it, it, there's no way that, that these views are going to just disappear on their own. Its policies have got to change. Things have got to, to be different. And uh, thus far, you know, we've had some close calls, but uh, nothing has really happened yet. But it, it is, it's, and of course, one of the things that may be difficult to understand or to believe is that when Ahmadinejad makes statements like this, when he goes over to an Arab country uh, on a visit, nobody says anything publicly about any of those statements or anything else. But privately, he's probably hearing, you know, I'm glad you can say that. I'm glad you're willing to stand up. And for Iran, which sees itself as sort of the leader of the Muslim world, that's, that, they see that as a kind of payoff. So, but it is very much tied up in the whole Palestinian-Israeli dispute and sort of where it goes from there. And it's a fact of, it's a result of that endless problem that has been going on and on and on. Yeah, this gentleman here. Well, thank you for your superb analysis of politics. And uh, what is the role, as you see it, of the Israel lobby today in the American foreign policy making? And what, would you comment on the appropriateness of the Israel lobby in our Middle East policy? Well, as you know, this, the, the Israeli lobby has been the subject recently of a major article that was published in the London Review of Books by two very, very well-known American uh, acad academicians, uh, which uh, basically made the case that, uh, uh, that pretty much that the United States has distorted its foreign policy completely because of, of the Israeli lobby and because of its power in Washington. Now, that lobby is very powerful. Uh, it has a, a very, very strong voice uh, in, in the Congress and in the, the population. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, but I think, for instance, would I say that, uh, that Dick Cheney is somehow a slave to the, to the APAC? No, I really don't think that's true. Do I think that Bush's policies on Iraq were dictated by Israel? I absolutely do not believe that at all. Uh, it probably makes it easier, if you're making a decision, to have the lobby on your side. Uh, I mean, let's face it, it's not the only lobby that, that, that is at work. Uh, um, AARP is, by, the, by all accounts, the, the, the most effective lobby in Washington. Uh, and shortly after that, and all of, some of us are represented there, uh, the, and the other Notable case is uh, Cuba, where American policy has been distorted, I would say, totally uh, for many, many years, out of deference to the people who came across from Cuba and who are one-issue people and, and have developed a really powerful uh, political machine that uh, keeps us on a particular path. Um, there's no question that, the, that APAC does lobby on behalf of Israeli interests, and uh, they have an effect. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Do they determine American foreign policy? I really don't think so. But I think there's nothing wrong in looking honestly at what they do. I think, and a number of people have written, I mean, there's a book called The Lobby, uh, which looks at this. There are a number of other books. Um, my uh, good friend James Chase wrote a book called Israel in the Mind of America, which is, I think, one of the finest uh, pieces of analysis and history that I've seen any place. And if you haven't read it, I recommend it to you because uh, what it does is trace the whole history of the Jewish community and the pro-Israeli community uh, in Washington and sort of what happened to it over the years and how it grew and changed and developed. And the apex tremendous power is, we forget, fa really fairly new. This is not something that was true 20 years ago. It has grown very rapidly in the last few years. But uh, they, they're well organized and they know what they're doing. Yes, sir, back there. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm somewhat 
you're not an expert in Russia, but I am somewhat perplexed by the Russian role in this whole issue. It is not in Russian interest to have a nuclear Iran on its southern border. So what are they doing supplying them with technology, know-how? At the same time, they seem to be playing a double game. They just launched an Israeli satellite to presumably watch over Iran. Maybe <laughs> Um, well, you're right. I'm not an expert on, on Russia. And I think it would be foolish of me to sort of speculate as to what their interests are. But I think my own personal take is that these are, this is a country that wants to rebuild its position as a power and have some independence, basically. I think what we're seeing on the part of certainly Russia, but a number of other countries as well, is a reaction to the American uh, policy, especially after 9-11, that said, you know, we're number one and we're going to stay that way. We make the rules for ourselves. Everybody else has to follow what we tell them to do. Uh, we are above the law. These are all written down, actually, and are part of our national strategy. We've backed away from that a little bit in the meantime. But what it really did, unnecessarily in my view, was tempt every other country in the world to cut us down to size a little bit. And I think we're seeing a little of that, just uh, tweaking the American tail. Uh, and I think that there's an interest in doing that that didn't have to be there. But whenever you're the biggest guy on the block and you're the biggest target, uh, I think you can expect some of that. And I think some of what Russia is doing is that. I think we really need to take some other questions. This gentleman back here. You've noted the impact of the hostage crisis on American attitudes. To what extent does the 1953 regime change for Bolshevik still impact on, on Iranian attitudes? The 1953 event is still very much alive in Iranian thinking. And, uh, but you know, you've got to, you've got to remember, and some, many people don't realize that uh, Khomeini was no lover of Mossadegh. Uh, he saw him as a secular leader, and he was careful not to attack him openly uh, in public because he knew he had lots of support. And a lot of the people who were fighting for the revolution were, in fact, uh, Mossadeghists and, and came out of that tradition. Um, after they got into power, they tried, in fact, to even stop uh, having a, uh, an annual celebration uh, of his birthday or whatever it was. So um, Mossadegh has some of his following. The, the, the mullahs are not that happy with Mossadegh because they see him as a, a secular leader. But nevertheless, there, there is uh, support for that. Uh, but a lot of people still do, and the people who see themselves as potentially really Democrats, reformers, opening up the system, in many cases really do come out of that Mossadegh background. And it's a very live issue. Just as, I mean, most Iranians haven't forgotten that at all. Just as I think a lot of Americans, I, when I speak to civic groups and things like that, I find people who talk about the hostage crisis as if it had just happened yesterday. Uh, increasingly, those people are getting older and older, and, uh, and in time, that will probably pass. I find that my own students now at Columbia uh, have no such. I mean, some of them remember seeing it on television when they were kids and sort of being aware that something was going on, but that was about it. And, uh, and there's a generation coming along that will just, it'll just be history. One of my wife's students asked her uh, a few years ago, said, has there been a World War III? Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is just, this is just, you know, it's all, well, there was World War I and there was two, and, you know, was there a number three? I don't know. I mean, it, it's, all just, it's all just names. It's all just stuff. So eventually, history turns into just that. But, but it's still a while to go, I think. It's like the Civil War is still uh, hasn't been forgotten by a lot of people. Um, uh, you know, this gentleman. Is there such a thing as a minimum requirement uh, on the part of the negotiator? In other words, there was a point where they said, don't negotiate with Yasser Arafat because he didn't negotiate with Arafat. You would negotiate in 1943 with Yasser um, The Iranian experience, it seems to me, has been a continual experience in the last 25 years of supporting terrorism supporting Hezbollah, supporting Syria, supporting in turn the Lebanese regime, uh, to me it's an Islamic fascist state. Can, can you 
trust them to negotiate? Is there certain criteria? I guess the if if you have to be friends and admirers to talk about problems, uh, there's something really that's not what negotiations are. I mean. When we were negotiating with the Russians, I mean, they had missiles pointed directly at us. There were, and the, the administration basically believed that almost all terrorism in the world originated from Russia. We've forgotten that, but that was absolutely believed by a whole generation of political analysts that that was, that you couldn't have terrorism any place in the world, that the Russians were not behind it. They believed that the Russians did the Iranian Revolution. Now, I, had, I had friends who, in the, in the White House who really believed that, that the Russians were doing it. But we were talking to them. Uh, should we not have? I mean, it, it's, and, and could we trust them? Well, uh, you know, you, you have to you know, trust and verify, as Reagan put it. You, know, uh, you can't just say, oh, we trust you, so if you say it, it must be good. Well, whoever negotiated that way? I mean, the whole purpose of a negotiation is to take two sides that have differences, not that they all agree on everything, and try to work those out somehow. And nobody's saying that it would be easy, but I do believe that if you get an agreement, for instance, to stop you know, uh, centrifuges at a certain level, and you get an agreement for the IAEA to be present with cameras and inspectors all the time, 24 hours a day, and that you have other, you have a signed agreement that you can go and look any place that you want to at whatever time you want to. Uh, when if the Iranians break that, we'll know it. Shouldn't we have that? I mean, should we say we're not going to try to get that agreement because who knows? We, they might trick us. No, I just don't share that. I mean, I don't see that as as an as, a, as an inhibitor for us to do what I think really needs to be done. Uh, it's. I, I don't, you don't have to love them. You really don't. In fact, if you did, it would all be too easy. You know? Yes, ma'am. Um, I really appreciated your analysis. It seemed very logical to me. Your thoughts were certainly logical, but they seemed precisely the opposite of the analysis and policy prescriptions we're hearing from the administration. <laughs> Can you explain to us what the motivations and strategies there are that are leading to what we hear. Well, you know, actually, I, after Cy Hirsch wrote his uh, recent piece uh, saying that there were, you know, plans afoot for nuclear activity, that the plans were being developed for a nuclear strike against Iran, that the United States had forces on the ground in Iran already conducting small-scale operations and trying to break off parts of Iran and so forth. Uh, I had a long conversation with him afterward. We have this sort of running conversation over the years. And, um, and I said, you know, I, there's something to be said for your analysis, particularly because I think it'll inspire a public debate, which we need on this subject, and that that's really very good. But I said, you know, I, I really have my doubts about whether that is really true, whether they are, in fact, gearing up to do this. And I went through my analysis of why that didn't seem very likely to me. And uh, he listened all the way through. And he said, well, he said, Gary, your problem is that you're rational. And uh, it may be a weakness. You know, um, I, uh, I've been wrong uh, about a number of things recently um, in terms of being too rational, uh, when in fact uh, an irrational impulse was in fact what was driving the thing, or what appears to me to be an irrational impulse. So can I say absolutely that nobody in Washington is actually going to do this? No, I can't say that. Uh, but I, this, is not, this is not the run-up to Iraq. The difference between the run-up to Iran and the run-up to Iraq is that we've been through Iraq. And I don't think that it is strategic analysis or rationality that is going to carry the day. It's pure self-interest. Any administration, and I, some people are arguing, you know, the best thing that the administration could do to prepare for the November elections is uh, carry out a, a, an invasion or a, an attack on, on Iran. I think that's absolutely wrong. I think the American people at one time might have felt that way. I just don't think there's, I don't think there's a lot of support for it right now. And I think, 
I think the military might revolt. And I think there's a, you no, know, I think they might just refuse to do it. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on currently that I think makes it far more difficult for the administration to think about doing this kind of thing than, than was true a few years ago. And um, you know, some of that may be good and some bad, and perhaps I'm overstating the case. You know, I can't, uh, I can't tell You're you. You scared me. Yeah, but I, I do believe that if the administration actually looks at the numbers and examines what the consequences are likely to be, um, that if they're concerned about any kind of a legacy and if they're concerned about uh, actually survival, uh, that they will look. And you listen to what Condi Rice is saying these days and what the president is saying for that matter. They say nothing is off the table, but then they say this is a diplomatic issue. We haven't even begun the diplomacy yet. We're just starting with the, with the Security Council. There's a lot of work to do on this and that. So uh, I think they're sending a pretty clear signal that they've looked at the, at the other choices and that they're not very attractive. I think probably we should yeah, close it down uh, at this point. You've spoken with us now very generously for an hour and a half. Uh, well, it is war. More than made the point that, uh, that you're a sober Sufi. And uh, thank, you, thank you very much.